Thank you, Pear Sister. Um, our next speaker will be Amy Malik, um, who will be speaking with us about memory, media work, and nostalgia, nafisi on the Iranian diaspora. Hello. <clears throat> thank you, Shireen, for that warm introduction. Um, thank you also to Danny and your whole team for, ee, for having us here. Um, this is such a wonderful opportunity that um, uh, when we were first invited uh, pre-pandemic was so exciting and then the you know wind got knocked out of us literally um, so I'm really grateful that we can all be here together together today um, and that we can be um, with you Hamid. Um, I first met um, Hamid Nafisi as a prospective graduate student. Uh, as graduate students, we're all advised to, you know, reach out to the scholars whose work we admire and maybe see if they'll, like, you know, guide us, be a mentor. And it's a very scary thing to do, you know, coming right out of college, not knowing what the response is going to be. Will they even respond to me? And um, Hamid's response was so warm, so open, so generous, without knowing anything about who I was or what I was up to. Um, and that kind of generosity is um, unmatched. It's really something that encourages young scholars in a way that uh, I can't really put into words. Um, so <clears throat> the other thing that we're encouraged to do as graduate students is to take um, big questions of the field and rethink them or come up with something entirely new uh, to study. Uh, so as a graduate student interested in cultural production in the Iranian diaspora, Hamid's work simultaneously made that um, task both a pleasure um, and an enormous challenge. <laughs> uh, on the one hand, his warm, open, and personable uh, reaction to my out-of-the-blue introduction email had made me feel both capable of the task at hand and also encouraged to undertake it. And of course, meeting him in person only reaffirmed that that generosity was indeed genuine and not just taught off, right? <laughs> um, but uh, meanwhile, his research, um, you know, inspired so many of us to look at the flourishing cultural production of Iranian diaspora communities in a serious way, uh, seeking to balance critical engagement, ethnographic attention, and theoretical inquiry, as he so skillfully does, to better appreciate the ways liminality and exilic positions are being negotiated through both high and popular culture. On the other hand, the enormous challenge, of course, is that how many times did I think I had perhaps come across a new idea or observation, only to find in a quick reread of the making of exile cultures that Hamid had of course observed at first, and of course with a far more attuned eye at that, and indeed, to this day, I continue to marvel at how the major contributions Hamid Nafisi has offered our fields remain not only relevant, but fresh. And perhaps even more marvelous is that even it, it, it is even in the smaller notes, uh, um, observations, uh, even field notes that he presented in his texts and lectures that have turned out to be not just fascinating nuggets, but the seeds of so much important work in our fields today. I know I don't need to demonstrate uh, to this audience how impactful his work has been in the growth of Iranian diaspora studies, and Paris Sistan just did a, a wonderful job of that. But if we only look at the making of Exile Cultures, published in 1993, and leave for now the groundbreaking work that would be published in the following years, um, we can quickly find an illustration of my point. So while the subtitle, Iranian Television in LA, might suggest to an unfamiliar uh, reader that this book is only about television and a very niche uh, field and a very niche audience at that, um, those of us who have read and reread this text know well that there is so much more to this rich book. Having been the first of its kind and published so early in the history of uh, what would become known as the capital of the Iranian diaspora in the United States, uh, the making of exile cultures has become a foundational text for the study of diasporic culture writ large. In just the first chapter, Exile Discourse, Hamid outlined not only a framework for a study of Iranian exilic cultural production in Los Angeles, he also covered wide intellectual ground. He talked about ethnicity and language in the context of LA's immigrant communities. He discussed Iranian culture and history prior to the revolution, made an argument for seeing the polysemy of high and pop culture, an assessment of the demographics of the Iranian communities of LA, and he offered a taxonomy of exile that drew on anthropological ideas from Van Gennep and Turner about symbolic liminality and ambivalence. Among these groundbreaking pages, we can certainly find traces of what would become key inspirations for analyzing cultural production of diaspora groups well beyond Iranians and well belong well beyond LA. 
But when reading this and rereading this in 2022, and in light of the growing field of Iranian diaspora studies that owes an enormous debt to his research, I couldn't help but also note some smaller, if no less important threads that my colleagues and I have pulled upon, whether we actually realize initially that we were pulling on threads from Hamid at all. Today I want to offer several of those kernels of wisdom, whether observations, footnotes, or key examples um, from this particular book about exile, memory, diaspora, race, and identity that we can easily connect to what have become central contributions to the growing field of Iranian diaspora studies. So perhaps most obvious, we can look at new work on Iranian cultural production in LA. Ethnomusicologist Farzan Ahemasi's excellent 2020 book, Tehranjala's Dreaming, Intimacy and Imagination in Southern California's Iranian Pop Music is a standout example. Her book offers not only ethnographic and ethnomusicological analyses, but also a history of cultural production in Los Angeles and focused attention on the music video genre. That Iranian music videos should be considered worthy of ethnographic attention, of course, was a contribution from Hamid Nafisi. But beyond this, as Hamasi herself put it, many of Hamid Nafisi's observations continue to accurately describe contemporary Tehranjalist tropes and aesthetics, especially among Tehranjalist's founding cohort. Hamid's compelling analyses of music videos demonstrated how important symbolism and aesthetics <clears throat> have been to understanding the fetishization and nostalgia that continue to underpin much of the symbolic resources mobilized in Iranian diaspora and cultural production in Tehranjalist and beyond. Hamasi's analysis is especially concerned with the ways that producers of Iranian music and media in LA aim to create a transnational mediascape. In other words, to quote, create globally circulating popular music and media that reach and remake Iranian culture in the realm of the imagination and on the ground, end quote. Here, her analysis demonstrates that the production of music and music videos in Los Angeles had as much to do with creating intimacy with Iran as with building communities in diaspora, the seed of which, of course, Hemi Nafisi had planted early in Making of Exile Cultures, noting that, however, some of what is aired in Los Angeles is in turn pirated and exported to the homeland. These cultural exchanges to and from Los Angeles have helped to globalize the Los Angeles culture to an unprecedented degree in terms of both exporting culture from it and importing culture into it, with the profits naturally favoring the metropolis. Now, he was writing in the uh, early 1990s here uh, about pop culture, television, and cinema. He could not yet predict the ways the internet would impact the circulation and the production of nostalgia that had already uh, been diagnosed in these uh, music videos and in LA exilic television. Of course, he would do that later after 2009, as we heard from um, Negar earlier. Nevertheless, much of this th uh, theoretical work on nostalgia and memory in making of exile cultures has laid fertile ground for studies of nostalgia online. Nafisi described nostalgia in the context of exile in the making of exile cultures as, quote, a constituent part of human development that serves to repair our discontinuous identities as both individuals and collectivities by appealing to origins and commonalities, end quote. And indeed, while the nomenclature of exile may have dispersed into many directions, including diaspora, uh, a focus on nostalgia and memory in this way of repair has been really generative in my own thinking. And it, of course, resonates well in the 21st century, as so many of us have picked up on the memory work that both first and second generation Iranians in diaspora have engaged in online. For example, Donya Ali Najad's 2017 book, The Internet and Formations of Iranian Americanness, Next Generation Diaspora, draws on Nafisi's work on memory to examine the digital lives of second generation Iranians in Los Angeles. In another direction, my own research on the Iranian di digital diaspora examines the ways family photographs and home movies have been remediated and circulated online. This work greatly benefited from Hamid's examinations of nostalgic symbolism in cultural productions like music videos, news programs, and television magazines. In a 2020 article in Memory Studies inspired by Hamid's work, I focused on the digital circulations of pre-1979 Iranian family photos and home movies by 1.5 and second generation in diaspora to argue that remediated family archives prompt a subjunctive form of nostalgia among descendants of the immigrant generation, one that is an imaginative, wishful response enabled by diasporic liminality. Digitized images of this particular time space, what I called the chronotope of pre-revolutionary Iran, 
have become an evocative site of memory for the Iranian diasporic post-generation. This is the generation of children of whose parents experienced the traumas of revolution, war, and exile. Hamid had already studied nostalgic tropes, what he described as fetish souvenirs, found in music videos produced by Iranian exiles after immigration in the 1980s. He said, the quote, real past threatens to reproduce itself as a lack or a loss, so it is against the threat of such a loss that the nostalgic past must be turned into a series of nostalgic objects, into fetish souvenirs that can be displayed and consumed over and over. Perhaps unsurprisingly, photo albums played a prominent role among these exilic souvenir fetishes in music videos of the period he studied. But even beyond these, Nafisi identified several chronotopes in the cultural production of the exile generation. In the Iranian films and videos that he analyzed, chronotopes of nature in particular emerged as an evocative source of representations of home. Quote, wilderness, sea, bird, sea, birds, and gardens act as icons, indexes, and symbols of the natural order and of Iranian cosmology. In exile, each of these signs heightens the experience of the other and of the senses, and each intensification in turn enlarges the grandeur of the other. <clears throat> I've offered here uh, some examples of the ways that these images are remediated online. First on Iranian.com, those of you who were uh, familiar with Iranian diaspora, particularly in the 90s and 2000s, this was like the place to be online. Um, and there's a whole section called Nostalgia that encouraged users to upload their own family photos, right? And so many of those images are of these trips to the Caspian, right? These trips of um, going to the north, um, uh, being in moments of leisure. And indeed, this was another kind of um, chronotope that um, Hamid uh, identified. He said, the chronotope of the sea, and especially the Caspian Sea, provided a particularly powerful aff affective response for the exile generation. Quote, videos vicariously and nostalgically transfer the primarily bourgeois exiles to their childhood, to their past, and to the good old days by the Caspian Sea, end quote. As I was working on this project and reading this text, uh, I couldn't help but think, was he looking at the same family photos I was looking at, right? He was thinking about music videos, and yet so clearly it was applying to a, a different genre altogether. For the second and subsequent immigrant generations, the emotional valences of this nature chronotope and their families' visual archives rely not on their personal experiences of Iranian nature, and indeed they may not have ever experienced Iran themselves. Instead, it relies on representation through retellings and key visual tropes in family photographs and home movies. The remediation of these images makes it clear that images of pre-revolutionary Iran have become a site of memory for this post-generation. But importantly, and distinct from the immigrant generation's nostalgia, the post-memorial nostalgia, I argue, is neither restorative in intent, for example, aiming to reproduce a golden age in the present, whether politically or otherwise, nor does it solely rely on either their own or others' forms of memory. Rather, I show that post-memorial forms of nostalgia are generated from liminal positions that are subjunctive. The diasporic subjects who oscillate between here and there and neither here nor there build belonging and negotiate identity through both direct and indirect memories. A process that, that this process also necessarily relies, therefore, upon imagination. The resulting subjunctive nostalgia, I argue, is a creative production beyond recalling memories of the past or projecting what should be in the future, focusing instead on foreclosed possibilities, what could have been. Notably, while his focus was on the first generation producers of music videos and their use of, fe of fetish souvenirs, chronotopes, and symbolism, in 1993, Hemi Nafisi presciently recognized the ways in which these would be mobilized in developing a nostalgic view of Iran in a diasporic second generation, who at the time of his study in LA were increasingly becoming assimilated Iranian Americans. As he put it at the time, these souvenirs, fetishes, icons, symbols, and narratives operate as cultural mnemonics through the circulation of which the exiles attempt to transmit to their children, who are fast becoming American, the parents' native cosmologies and values which they feel are threatened." End quote. This effort, however, was already having mixed results in 1993. 
In his conclusion, he noted, a younger generation of pop singers and videographers raised in exile have been producing music videos that do not invoke Iranian wilderness, sea, birds, and gardens. Influenced by the dominant American music television channels and driven by their own individuating psychology, many of them are focusing more on interpersonal relationships here and now than on the relationship between here and there. The younger generation is now less in touch with the timeless vastness of nature that span time and space for the older generation. Instead, it is more open to the intimate intensity of everyday exilic affairs. In this way, immensity and symbiosis have, be have began to give way to intimacy and individuation. The communal notion of the self, energized by the collective memory of the elsewhere and nostalgic return to it, is being replaced by individuation and individual positioning here and now. While this early diagnosis of the 1.5 and second generation in America rings true to some extent, it's also challenged by this post-memorial work of artists in these um, descendant generations that circulate online. The 1.5 and second generation has in many ways inherited these exilic tropes and chronotopes of nature, and especially the Caspian Sea, by way of oral and textual re retellings, but also via photos and films from the family archive that inflect second generation post-memory with the losses felt so deeply by their parents and represented in the cultural analysis and, cult and the cultural products that Nefisi analyzed. That he did not foresee the continued potency of remediated and subjunctive nostalgia post-memorial work of the second generation does not, however, invalidate that prediction. While much of the second generation's diasporic cultural production has moved towards hybridity and is influenced heavily by the European, American, and other cultural forms that surround them, a genre of artistic production has emerged that is indeed rooted in individual positioning here and now, but that is also nevertheless very much influenced by a wistful nostalgia, looking back at what was and imagining what could have been. So I want to kind of go back to my rethinking of um, uh, the kernels of wisdom and making of exile cultures. Beyond these perhaps more obvious influences I just mentioned, Nafisi's discussion of exilic cultural production also offered seeds that would grow beyond the main contributions of the book. For example, in his initial explication of exilic syncretism, <clears throat> uh, he offered the example of the figure of Haji Firuz, which Nafisi described as, quote, an ancient minstrel who, a few decades, a few days before each New Year's arrival on March 20th or 21st, appears in the streets in blackface, cracking jokes, singing, and dancing, end quote. <clears throat> in the text, he stated, quote, immediately after the revolution, Iranian exiles attempted to equate Haji Firuz with Santa Claus. The equivalence did not last long chiefly because in its new American context, with its own uneasy and racist history of the blackface mode, exposed the hitherto inoffensive subtext of the Iranian blackface character, end quote. He doesn't elaborate on it further in the text, but in a footnote, he elaborates citing an Iran Times article that pointed out that Haji Firuz as a blackface caricature was already noted as offensive to African Americans in 1978. Hamid's early attention to the racial politics of Iranians in America was pre prescient in a number of ways. Scholars and community members have debated the presence of Haji Firuz and blackface in American public spaces in the intervening years and continue to do so today. Adding to a set of contestations I noted in reaction to seeing a blackface Haji Firuz uh, in the streets of New York City in the early years of the Persian parade. This is from the late 2000s, as, by way of example. <clears throat> but more recently, those claims to the character's, quote, inoffensive subtext, as he put it, um, have also been critiqued and put under close historical scrutiny by historian Bita Barulizadeh in her now off-cited 2012 um, Ajim MC article and its elaboration in a 2021 article in Lateral, uh, Journal of Cultural Studies Association. Dr. Barulizadeh's work is, quote, concerned with questions of memory and the visuality of blackness in Iran and the broader region, including the Iranian diaspora. Furthermore, in footnote 11 of chapter one <laughs> of Making of Exile Cultures, I love Hamid's footnotes. Uh, he describes the ways that some Iranians in an, and other Middle Easterners as well have benefited from education and professional careers prior to migration alongside what he called in 1993, quote, white skin privilege, end quote, or being white but, but not quite, using this to leapfrog other immigrant groups. This was very early uh, to be thinking about these kinds of questions. And it's something that really drew, drew my attention again in 2022, noting how the field has grown to be thinking about racialization of Iranians. He said, 
Despite this white skin privilege, it didn't, present, it didn't prevent Iranians and Middle Eastern Americans from having to, quote, put up with the vagaries of a system of racial and ethnic classification that refuses to recognize them as an official minority. As a result, they are caught in a zone of unofficial statelessness, neither white nor minority, end quote. What a footnote. Since 1993, of course, studies of racialization of Iranians has developed into a strong line of inquiry of its own in the Iranian diaspora studies. We might look first at um, John Tehranian's uh, 2009 book, Whitewashed, America's <clears throat> Invisible Middle Eastern Minority, who kind of pulled this thread from a legal perspective, putting forward the notion of selective racialization to describe the racial paradox that Nafisi had observed a decade earlier. And of course, more recently, in 2017, <clears throat> excuse me, sociologist Netta Makbula's award-winning Limits of Whiteness, Iranian Americans in the Everyday Politics of Race, offered a fuller ethnographic analysis of the paradox through research among Iranian American youth and their parents. <clears throat> she presented theoretical tools through which we can better understand the racialization of Iranian Americans and especially the divergence of experiences among first and second generations as navigating racial hinges and racial loopholes. What Hamid had described as an unofficial statelessness, she describes as racial loopholes. These loopholes, she persuasively argued, are, quote, the everyday contradictions and conflicts that emerge when a group's legal racial categorization is inconsistent with its on-the-ground experience of racialization and deracialization. The case of Iranian Americans deepens our understanding of the interplay between top-down and bottom-up racialization processes, as well as troubling long-standing assumptions about assimilation by immigrant groups into mainstream American society, end quote. Thus, what Hamid Nafisi had described in the early 1990s in a footnote as a racial paradox of Iranian American experiences of being white but not quite has become a key note of scholarship for Iranian diaspora studies scholars who continue to investigate immigrant racialization in the United States. So when Danny first asked for a title for our presentations, you know, I think like several of us, we have really big eyes. We're like, we're going to do all the things. <laughs> we know all the things, right? So I, but I want to mention one more um, line of scholarship that Hamid offered that I don't think gets enough attention, um, though I know several of you in this room certainly are aware of it and are I'm grateful for it as well. Um, and that is uh, media work. So in a 1995 article or chapter, Afisi defined media work as mass media that acts as an agent for hegemonic ideologies. A key characteristic of media work is that it reformats or disguises the dominant ideologies latent in its representations, thereby enabling the maintenance of hegemonic consensus about the Middle East as though it were everyday common sense rather than, quote, a self-contained set of political opinions or biased views, end quote. This is something that uh, 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 takes uh, Hamid's work in another direction, right? He was best known perhaps for studying Iranian cinema, Iranian media, but he also has been very uh, uh, conscientious about studying US media about Iran and the way that Iranians are represented in US media. And so this is something that I found really, really helpful in, in thinking through um, some of these self-representations in diaspora that I see. Why is it that Iranians are so adamant that we must represent ourselves in particular ways different from this, right? And it's because of the power of media work that you so correctly diagnosed, in my opinion. So <clears throat> he says, we must uh, analyze media to uncover the latent ideology inherent in what happens to be, what appears to be impartial processes and how these ideologies become naturalized and apparently eternal. How does this happen? This is the long quote here. Um, but that media work produces consensus by means of a number of processes that involve not only the mass media and the popular culture, but also the industrial, financial, and marketing apparatuses that design, produce, and market consumer goods, tie-in products, and novelty items. By means of these processes, the oppositional other is continually incorporated, co-opted, and domesticated. Through appropriation, the inappropriate becomes appropriate. Media work's most intense work on the other coalesces around television and the manner in which it produces, circulates, and naturalizes a certain limited representation of society's others, end quote. This Western media, distributed globally and now increasingly digitally, closely con connects entertainment with power, as we heard about in the last panel as well. Indeed, Hamid, through media work, has studied not just media produced by Iranian exiles, but also U.S. produced media, TV, books, films, news, and ephemera, <clears throat> 
that have continued, uh, uh, that have contributed to the media work about Iran and that has left many Iranians in diaspora frustrated and yearning to respond. And is it in these kind of counter representations that aim to reclaim and repair, there's that word again about nostalgia, repair the image of Iran as inherently evil that we also find first 1.5 and second generation cultural producers in some ways drawing upon those fetish souvenirs and spectacular images described in the making of exile cultures. Interviewed in 1990 for Zora Sullivan's collection of Iranian diaspora narratives, um, Nafisi was finishing his PhD at UCLA when he summarized what he saw as a problem of fetishization among LA Iranians with important ramifications on cultural identity. He said, the danger of course is to create from a position in exile an imaginary thing called Iran, which is precisely what in my studies I feel Iranians have done in LA. They have created an imaginary Iran and they have fetishized it at a particular time in history and they keep circulating these fetishes in their newspapers and magazines and television programs while the thing itself, Iran itself, is undergoing developments and evolving in ways they don't know anything about." End quote. Noting that like all fetishes, these both contain some truths while suppressing others, his observations made in light, late 1980s LA of a freezing of time and place has been challenged in a number of ways, of course, since the 1990s. By continued migration of young people from Iran who were born after the revolution, for example, by the opening of travel to Iran in the 90s and 2000s, where experiencing post-revolutionary Iran challenged the fetishized images broadcast on LA satellite channels the different experiences of second and third generation children, and new forms of cultural and social networks and knowledge made possible by the internet, including social media and digital programming coming from other parts of the diaspora that challenge the LA version of things. And yet, there is still a resonance in diaspora in the continued use of these kinds of spectacles um, of a pre-revolutionary time and place that I, uh, in my book project, am referring to as imperial nostalgia, which again is borrowed from Hamid Nafisi. He used it to think about the multiplex cinema and how <clears throat> this kind of uh, view of a pre-revolutionary um, time can be seen through an imperial lens. So much like the spectacles of ancient empire that were used by the Shah in his 1971 uh, 2500 year celebration, the symbolic weight of figures, artifacts, and ruins from ancient Iran make them potent symbols for our diaspora community seeking to counter US media work. For example, we have these kinds of nationalist representations in the New York Persian Parade um, that incorporate both 3D replicas of ancient sites as well as costumed parade performers directly inspired by that 1971 celebration. And indeed the sound booming from this float is from the documentary um, about the celebration, right? <clears throat> we also find, of course, um, costumed parade performers. We find uh, structures, uh, 3D replicas of um, uh, sites from Pasargad, from uh, Persepolis, of the Cyrus Cylinder, etc. <clears throat> the aim of countering media stereotypes um, was not just hinted at in these public performances of Iranian identity, but also includes directly countering Hollywood, putting forward an image <clears throat> Oh, sorry, I forgot to mention, this also, of course, happens in Southern California as well. This is from Mehrigan Festival, which Hamid also mentions in the making of exile cultures. <laughs> nothing is new, nothing is new. Uh, <laughs> but they, uh, of course, use these kind of 3D replicas of, of these ancient um, symbols. Going back to the parade, it's not only the um, symbols that get used here, but directly countering Hollywood, not just symbolically, but in, in text, uh, in the parade itself. Um, also, putting forward an image of what Persians really look like rather than those depicted as monsters in the film. Um, but these kinds of public performances and public counter representations are a testament to the kind of media work and the power of media work that a lot of these individuals are seeing. Um, and so the image of Cyrus the Great, the Cyrus Cylinder, Persepolis, Pasargada appear in a vast array of ephemera from pamphlets and posters to large 3D replicas. In each of these examples, Iranian culture, uh, <coughs> excuse me, aims to, uh, in each of these examples of Iranian culture and its representations in the public, whether um, for sale or in a, a festival setting, uh, present rescaled facsimile, facsimiles of the quote, real thing. And here we can hear Hamid's work on mimesis. We can hear syncretism. Um, these are examples are, uh, that are testament to the enduring attraction of that imperial nostalgia um, that I've mentioned. I will close with this. My current book project aims to bring forward some of the ways current, uh, different experiences of immigration, of diaspora, of media work, and of Iran have created competing visions of Iranian identity made especially visible 
through comparison. While Los Angeles has been considered a cultural capital of the diaspora, since the 2000s, competing centers like Toronto or Stockholm have emerged, where more recent waves of migration have created a community more connected to contemporary Iran, through perhaps, though perhaps no less critical of its government. And to be sure, Iranians everywhere in diaspora are likely to express pride in its ancient traditions, uh, as well as criticisms of the Islamic Republic. The difference is perhaps in degree and emphasis rather than of kind, but nevertheless, the imperial nostalgia that Nafisi described in the films and media he analyzed is, I argue, alive and well, and taking new and increasingly uh, mainstream forms. I want to close by just reiterating what everyone else has already said, basically, right? That Hamid's impact on his fields have been enormous. Um, He's served on several of our dissertation committees, uh, served as a trusting and wise mentor well beyond the dissertation stage. His generosity of time has always been matched in generosity of spirit. And like Nargis, he made sure to cite me, a little grad student at the time, in his social history of Iranian cinema, which is such an incredible model to follow of citational practices. He's also a model of the kind of scholar we all want to be, constantly asking questions, remaining curious, not publishing a book and then fading into the, the background, right? Um, I watched uh, how some of my colleagues in graduate school didn't have such a mentor and who uh, basically wanted to create clones of themselves. Hamid never had to say, make uh, an article in my image. He never had to say, use my concept of media work, right? <laughs> We all already wanted to. We were all already keen to build on what he began. And we hope to kind of show how his work continues into the future. Um, the seeds that I've mentioned here have already begun to bear fruit, and we thank you so much for them. Thank you, Hamid.